Hey there, and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight, systemic racism in the banking industry and what's being done to help black communities build generational wealth. Reaction from a survivor of Chicago police torture now that the city is finally planning for a memorial. 50 years after its birth in the Bronx, hip hop has become a mainstay of American culture. We'll talk about Chicago's contribution to the genre. Plus, Chicago's own homegrown musical genre gets spinning in Humboldt Park this weekend at the House Music Festival. Made from a material that uh, will outlive probably everyone in this room. And art meets sustainability in a new partnership on the west side. All that coming up, but our first story tonight, building equity in the banking industry. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Generations of discriminatory lending practices and policies have taken a major toll on black communities, locking them out of being able to build generational wealth. A 2020 Northwestern study finds that for every $1 of accumulated wealth that white families have, black families have just one cent. Let that sink in. Local and state officials say they're working to address systemic racism in banking and to shrink that racial wealth gap. Joining us now with more are City Treasurer of Chicago, Melissa Conyers Irvin, Jessica Caffrey, Executive Director of the Cook County Land Bank Authority, and Xavier Ramey, CEO of Justice Informed, a social impact consulting firm. Thanks to the three of you for joining us. Welcome back. Uh, you, Melissa Conyers Irvin, let's start with you, please. Describe what systemic racism in banking looks like. Well, as you were stating that data statistic, I was thinking to myself, each time I hear that statistic, it still, it still does something on the inside. And certainly a young woman such as myself, born and raised in this city, living in underserved communities, truly know and understand what is needed. I think about systemic racism in the banking industry and how what it does is that it increases the racial wealth gap. And that is why myself and Illinois State Treasurer Ferrix formed the Advancing Equity and Banking Commission because we understand that in order to change systemic racism in the banking industry, in order to provide access to capital for residents and small business owners, especially in underserved communities, and we're talking specifically about black communities, in order to do that, we know that it must start from the top. We need to work with the leadership of these large bank institutions, make certain that they are buying into the mission and making certain that they respect the makeup of the taxpayers of Chicago. Jessica Caffrey, tell me a little bit about how this issue ties into the work of the Cook County Land Bank Authority. Yes, absolutely. So we know that the number one way of creating generational wealth is through home ownership. So what the land bank does is that we buy all the tax delinquent and the vacant properties, which could be lots or buildings, and we basically provide them to either homeowners, to community developers, nonprofits, or small business owners owners to repurpose them and bring them back to the community. Since the 20th century, there has been practice such as redlining, contract purchasing, and all of those things that have held us back nearly a hundred years. And we see the scars of that on the south and the west side of our communities. So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to reverse that, and that's why the land bank is here today. And we give us a sense of how, like, some of, uh, some of the things that you just named, you know, the contract buying and redlining how that sort of leads to what we see today, which is the disinvestment, right, and, and empty homes, vacant lots. Absolutely, it leads to all of the above. And just in 2008, the foreclosure crisis, there in 2005, there were approximately 14,000 homes that were foreclosed on. By 2012, there were 85,000 homes that were foreclosed on. So we at the Land Bank, our mission alone is to say, hey, you know where the system has abandoned these houses and these neighborhoods? We say, wait a minute, there is value there. And once we get someone who cares and wants to invest in their community, that these could be thriving communities and really the cornerstone for their community going forward. Xavier, as an entrepreneur, you've said that you have faced barriers yourself in getting access to funding and to capital. How would you say your experience is you know, similar to what many other black business owners might also experience? 
Yeah, well, when thinking about access to capital for entrepreneurs, there's a couple of different things you have to think about. One is the reality of how non-institutional funding works. So by that, I mean things like friends and family, angel investors, venture capitalists. And then you have institutional funding, which is more your traditional banks, your, your small business loans, these sorts of things. As it relates to non-traditional lenders, it's almost impossible uh, to get any interest from angel investors, venture capitalists, private equity, these sorts of folks. Uh, in fact, globally, uh, only about 7% of all global capital, and that's in the trillions, is actually deployed towards black and brown owned businesses, um, which means that 93% of all other dollars are committed to white families and white dreams for what business should be. Um, as an entrepreneur myself, when I started Justice Informed in 2017, which is a social impact consulting firm, one of the first barriers is the fact that most people don't, uh, I think, anticipate that black people can sell something from their mind versus building products. Many times when companies are, or investors are looking to invest, they're thinking about us selling hair products or we're going to open up a restaurant. We are a consulting something firm, tangible. something very tangible. And so when it comes to services, it's very difficult to break into that space. Uh, in fact, uh, every single application, every single uh, program that we've applied for at Justice Informed over the last several years, uh, we've been denied every single one of them. Now we're running, you know, on, on the top end, we might have a 30% annual profit margin. On the low end, around 15%. Um, we have a minimum wage of $50,000. Um, we have profit sharing for all of our employees. Like these are the things that we want an equitable business to have. And I insist on it as a CEO, because I know what it feels like uh, when just the top is winning in a company and not the bottom. Uh, but these are some of the barriers. Melissa Conyers Irvin, obviously there's no one size fits all solution, um, but give us a sense of how your office is also helping communities in Chicago uh, in closing the racial wealth gap. One of the things, of course, you mentioned is the Advancing Banking Equity Commission. So in the Chicago Treasurer's Office, one thing that we're doing is to help empower residents to be able to access capital, whether it's to purchase a home, which First of all, I absolutely love, I feel like Jessica took the words out of my <laughs> mouth when she spoke about home ownership. I really talk a lot about building generational wealth, and I always say the quickest and easiest way to build generational wealth is through home ownership. And we want to be able to do that to be able to tr transfer that down for generations to come. But within the Chicago Treasurer's Office, we are focusing on empowering residents. How? Number one, let's talk about increasing your credit report. Let's also talk about budgeting. Let's talk about investing. Investing 101. Many people are intimidated by the stock market. Xavier mentioned venture capitalists, pa um, private equity. When people hear that, that terminology, they're intimidated by it. Right. You don't have to start there. There's investing one-on-one. -on -one. Those are things mm -hmm. we work at. And I have to say, at ChicagoCityTreasurer.com, there are certainly ways that residents, and I must admit um, that I have to include October 5th and 6th, huge summit that we are going to be having and it focuses on the road to building generational wealth and more at that with the chicago treasurer's office website all right and we'll call you close to yes. october as <laughs> yes. well i'm sure yes, yes, yes have to <laughs> uh jessica caffrey where do you see progress is being made in chicago in closing this racial wealth gap oh absolutely the land make is helping to achieve that progress for our residents so a couple things that we're doing one as i mentioned earlier we're removing all of the red tape right we're clearing the liens and the back taxes which could be tens of thousands of dollars that now a potential home owner or community investor doesn't have to pay because we're giving it to them clear title. One of the things that we've done is that we had, for instance, a group of uh, community developers. They were developing properties individually. They came together and collectively put their passion together and bought 11 lots on one block in the Woodline area. And what that enabled them to do was to build upon each other, right? So we took a, an investment that turned now into $8 billion that wasn't producing at all and created that inequity and community wealth just in that one area. Besides that, I would like to mention on um, thanks to President Perk Preckwinkle and the uh, Equity Fund is that we do have money for, for what's called purchaser assistance. So for all of our properties that we have at the land bank, we are offering up to $20,000 in purchaser's assistance grant to help with closing costs. We've also discounted all of our Inglewood properties by 50%. So if you would like, please go to our website mm -hmm. and you will see a list of all of our Inglewood properties dis discounted at 50%. Opportunity so we are, definitely, property. we are definitely moving the needle, <laughs> definitely moving the needle there. Uh, Xavier, what, you know, how are are other institutions responsible for helping to bridge the racial wealth gap in about a minute? Yeah. Less than a minute. First, I'd say that we have to disassociate ourselves from expecting the institution of racial injustice to move only by doing investment work. We have to understand that black communities and black families have been divested from. And so if every investment in black people also requires a mutual growth in white families and households income, then we're constantly just talking about an investment model uh, that, that doesn't actually repair things and specifically infuse cash. Uh, the half a trillion dollars that was committed by the Fortune 500 in the wake of George Floyd being killed 
killed. Only about 4% of that has been deployed, and the vast majority of it has been loans. So again, I'm saying that if they want their money back, that means that they insist on making money off of the work of repair. So that's one thing, to stop having this, this sort of uh, uh, we grow only, you only grow if we grow approach. The second thing I'd say uh, is to really think about these wage opportunities where we're, we're constantly in the work of diversity, equity, inclusion, talking about how do we get more African Americans and people of color into significantly higher wage jobs, $100,000 plus. We need to raise the floor instead of keep talking about raising the ceiling. The number of jobs that can exist at 60000 are significantly higher than the number of jobs at 100000 And there are not many companies that are really committing to the work of creating a sustainable middle class so, uh, but through their work. A lot of work to be done then, it sounds it's like. We can, a lot of work to we be can done talk about this for a while longer, but we're out of time. Melissa Conyers Irvin, Jessica Caffrey, and Xavier Ramey. Thanks to all three of you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. This week, Mayor Brandon Johnson announced a $6.8 million grant from the Mellon Foundation to build eight new public monuments. One of them is a long awaited monument to the black men tortured by officers under the orders of disgraced police commander John Burge. After Burge was convicted of perjury in 2010, a coalition of survivors and activists began organizing and planning for a memorial. In 2015, the city included a memorial as part of a reparations package. Mayor Johnson says $250,000 are finally set aside to build the monument titled Breath, Form and Freedom, which will include a timeline of events in the Burge case and the names of torture survivors. Among those survivors is Anthony Holmes, who was tortured by Burge in 1973, and he says he's pleased the memorial will finally be built. It was it was wonderful. <laughs> I can't uh, I can't express the depth you know, the depth of how I, fe how I felt, but it, you know it's it's, it's, a, it's a truly good good feeling. The memorial stand for all of us that was tortured and the ones you know was, was the ones that still here, you know and the ones that's not. It shows that they acknowledge the fact what took place with us is that they believe us, you know what I'm saying, and they honor us through the memorial, and that's and that's what it means to us. Because, like I say, it's our truth, and it shows that we ain't just, you know, talking about stuff that, you know, that, that didn't happen. This did happen. You know, now we can breathe a little easier. We can, you know, but we can't stop what we're doing because of the fact that still the people, this, it's, this is still going on. But it won't happen no more like it happened to us. And you can find more details about the history of Chicago police torture on our website. Up next, repurposing plastic into art to beautify Chicago's west side. Arts correspondent Angel Edo with that story right after this. organizations on the city's west side are on a mission to bridge the gap between art and sustainability with a new initiative aimed at redeeming plastic. Now I recently met up with some of the artists behind that initiative. Take a look. It starts with an assembly line of sorts. So these are already cut. You usually want to cut them down the middle to make it easier in the cleaning process. So we're going to put them in here. Washing and drying detergent bottles that have been collected from different laundromats throughout the city's west side. Then we have to dry it. So we have these drying racks and we label it. This is from Loads of Fun, laundry detergent, jug collection site. We then shred the plastics. It becomes these small little granules. And then from there, we put it into the extruder, which then heats it up and then extrudes into a solid beam. And for this, we're making two by threes for our bench. That's right. This very bench, which consists of eight beams, was made from what used to be detergent bottles. A lot of times we're just driving down the street and you notice like there's not as many benches in the west side. So, like this is an opportunity for us to kind of come together, design this object that's uh, accessible for public use and made from a material that uh, will outlive probably everyone in this room. It's a concept more than a year in the making, spearheaded by the organizations Altspace and Happy Returns with funding from Earth Art Chicago. We really loved that art was at the center of this, but so was the community piece because there are so many different ways for youth and community members to get involved in different aspects of not just developing this art, but also folks will be interacting with it because of the placement in the community afterwards. It's through a joint project, Redemptive Plastics, that Jordan Campbell says they're able to continue their mission of using both art and faith as a tool to galvanize communities. And it's a concept started by Campbell and his late business partner, John Veal. So there's a scripture I think about how we are all called to 
plant seeds and water, um, and that God's the only one that can allow these things to grow. And I think what we witnessed was John planted those seeds. You know, he was here encouraging, spurring people on, challenging people, but showing love. He talked about how sustainability is truly love over time. Now, Altspace has an ideal collaborator in Happy Returns, whose mission is aimed at the intersection of digital craft and recycling plastics. Together, the two groups want to take their love for sustainability as well as their love for community nationwide. In this project, we've uh, collected and processed about 800 pounds of plastic, and that's just in the last six weeks. That's just a small, like, fractional percentage of plastic that's consumed in a day in Chicago. It's not actually how much plastic we can like transition and redeem. It's more so this awareness tool of what happens to your yogurt cup. Does it actually get recycled? Through this project and with redemptive plastics, the awareness, and it's this tool in the community. We're hiring people, we're training them, and giving them the tools to go out and be artists that work with this material as well. So this is investment in the community, just as much as it's transformation of a landfill. Now, the folks at Altspace and Happy Return say that they're in need of volunteers in order to increase the production of their benches. Now, if you're interested in redeeming plastic, visit our website for more information. Now, Brandis, we go back to you. Angel, thank you. In 1973, DJ Cool Hertz set two copies of James Brown's Sex Machine album on the turntables at a Bronx house party and tried out his innovative technique of cutting and mixing songs at the drum breaks. Those breakbeats not only got the party started, they started a revolution as the foundation of hip hop. 50 years later, the genre has become an inextricable part of American music and culture. Joining us now with more are hip hop journalist Drea O, oh, Brandon Pope, anchor and reporter at CW26 Chicago and host of the WBEZ podcast Making, and music, culture, and cannabis journalist and photographer Mark Brayboy. Thanks to the three of you for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, Brandon, let's start with you, please. Hip hop has existed before all four of us were born. Uh, what is the first track that you remember that introduced you to hip hop? Wow, now that's a that's a heavy question, Brandon. <laughs> first track I remember. Uh, I mean, I grew up in the '90s, so I mean, I was I was growing up on Tupac and Biggie. I was growing up on on you know do or die. I was do, doing kinds of artists like that. But I think the first track that I resonated with, honestly, was Kanye West, uh, Through the Wire. Uh, that's probably the first hip hop track I really felt like, yo, this is something I feel. I can understand the message. I connect with it. And that's what, what really hip hop music is all about, that connection. That's why it's lasted so long. Well, and like I said, it's older than all of us, right? So it's like we've heard it all yeah, of our right. lives. It is, it is like, you know, the soundtrack of our lives. Uh, Drea, who would you put on the Mount Rushmore of Chicago hip hop artists? Chicago hip hop artists. So this is the all time. Okay. Um, etched in the stone. Etched in the Okay. I, of course, Kanye. Um, I would have to add Twister. Are we, is there a minimum? There's, well, it's four. Let's just try three for now. Okay. <laughs> You've got three. Kanye. So Kanye, <laughs> Twister, and gosh, this is so hard for the last one. I would love it to be a female, but it doesn't have to be. Not to brat. Yeah. Well, see, I mm. do like the brat, but I, I think that she doesn't mention that she's from Chicago as much. She's more of a national artist. And, and a lot of times with, um, Chicago artists that end up blowing up, they wear Chicago on their back and they're always like, I'm from Chicago, I'm from like Kanye. He constantly mentions that he's from Chicago, but I don't know if the brat mentions it that much, but mm. I think I would put- Maybe Common? Not Ooh. Common either. Right. Honestly, it would be someone from the new school. I would be like Chief Keef. All right. Only to just integrate everything. And, and with him being the leader of the drill movement that just took over recently, I would say him. All right, uh, Mark, do you think Chicago gets its place you know, like gets its due for its place in hip hop innovation? I think that's starting to happen now. Um, I think for a long period of time when you really, a lot of people aren't really fully aware of how Chicago black music as a whole directly and indirectly in, impacted hip hop, whether that's through gospel, R&B, 
soul, um, and our own hip hop innovations in a lot of ways. So I think that's something that's we're seeing kind of a little bit more now within a lot of music critics and things like that, because every music critic has a favorite Chicago artist, whether people realize it or not. I don't think we always may be aware of how much love we really get, but there's still we still have a long way to go. I don't think the Midwest as a whole gets enough respect or recognition when it comes to how we've pushed hip hop forward and everything like that. So it's got it's, it's a lot more work. It's going to take a lot more documentation. It's going to a lot more it's going it's going to take a lot more storytelling and, and things of that nature, but I think that's so, something that's going to is changing. I want to come back to something that Drea said because you know it's probably fair to say that Kanye uh, West is is probably if not the one of the biggest rappers to come out of Chicago, right? Brandon, you did a whole podcast right. about him. How big a part of his story is the city of Chicago? It's a large part of it, and, and it's because Chicago is a Midwest city with an identity of being an underdog. And Kanye West has made that a very big part of his own identity. You know, he talks about, you know what the Midwest is, young and restless. I mean, just that that saying itself embodies the swagger, the hustle, the heart that Chicagoans have. And you look at his career journey, having to knock down doors just to get where he is and prove to people that he is a great artist. Obviously, he had to leave and go to New York and L.A. to get some of the national fame, but he wears Chicago on his back and brought up a lot of Chicago hip hop artists along with him, putting on Twista, uh, Common, Rhymefest, GLC, and so many others in the process, Lupe Fiasco as well. So um, he's worn Chicago on his back more than many Chicago artists have, and the whole city's benefited because of it. Drea, what stylistic contributions would you say Chicago artists have made to hip hop? And one thing I want to ask you specifically about is drill music, right? Just as a Chicagoan, I didn't realize, I'm a Chicagoan now, right? I didn't realize that everybody else had heard of drill music now too, that it, like it's, it's a part of the, the hip hop culture as well. Yes. So in the recent years, Chicago has definitely been leading the charge for the drill movement, better or worse. Um, you know, a lot of people argue about whether the drill movement was a positive or a negative thing, but it's just the reality of a lot of people's lives in Chicago and it's just reflecting through the music. So um, the drill movement definitely has left its mark on hip hop culture in the last 10 years. It's started in Chicago, moved all the way to the UK, and now there's Brooklyn drill, the Bronx drill. So that all started from Chicago and it all started from the youth, um, he young, rappers from Chicago um, and it's still going. There's a lot of new artists here now um, that I would mention. A couple of new drill artists that I love like Tay Savage and there's just a new wave that's coming right now and um, it's got just exciting to see. Yeah, got a few folks I probably got to look up. We're almost yeah. out of time. Mark, sure um, nope, that would be my watch. Mark, you said some yes. women uh, are the ones to watch in the Chicago scene. Um, who, like in about 30 seconds, who are you expecting to see take off? There's a lot of women that's taking off right now. Right now, we have a whole wave, an unprecedented wave of women like we've never seen before. We've got Freddie Oso, we've got Amari Blaze, we've got Jay Bambi, we've got Mellow Bucks from uh, 79th and Essex. You know what I mean? We got uh, Monty the G, uh, Cashmere. It's a it's a whole slew right now. Vicky Streets, Baja Banks. So a it's lot a of whole folks that slew like you would never believe. A, a lot whole of folks lot of that you're excited that we need to about. Check out right now. I should probably mention exactly. you're on your and way it's to. Important that well, I just wanted to mention, because we're out of time, you're on your way to Summer Smash, Smash, which is the 50th anniversary. It's the big party that's happening in Chicago this weekend. We're all jealous, um, but I'm grateful mm -hmm. to all of you for joining us. Brandon Pope, <laughs> Mark Bravo, Andrea O. Oh, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And now it is time to talk about Chicago's contribution to the world of music, house music. If you're a house head, Humboldt Park Boathouse is the place to be on Saturday, June 24th, where DJs will be spinning the sounds and styles of the dance music genre from 11 to 9, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., people. It's presented in conjunction with the Taste of Chicago pop-up in Humboldt Park. Organizers say it'll be an homage to our city's cultural heritage. House is our cultural um, heritage here in the city of Chicago. It was a genre born and raised here in Chicago part of our DNA, I think, as Chicagoans. I think it's our calling card to the world. House is a feeling. Uh, house is a movement. Uh, house is a culture. Um, house is a way of life, basically. It could be in your dress, your style, I don't know, your swag. <laughs> 
So it's going to be a variety of different styles of house music. You know, as a civic event, uh, we try to be representative of all the different um, subgenres and, and styles of the, of the music. Uh, I like to play the music, so I'm hoping that everybody that's there is going to receive it as much as I love playing it. You know, the hands in the air, the sweat dripping off of you, the falling on the floor because you feel something. Just that vibration between the dancer and the person that's playing the music. I think it's a great opportunity for everyone who is either curious about house music, who hasn't had the opportunity to experience it, to come and experience it, you know, outside of its natural habitat, which is nightlife. But it's also for the house community to come out and celebrate, you know, during the day in a beautiful setting with amazing artists and friends, and um, it's just community. It's the Chicago House Music Festival kicks off at 11 a.m. on Saturday, June 24th on the Humboldt Park lawn. Admission is free and it's open to all ages. You'll find more details on our website. And that's our show tonight. Don't forget to join me this Monday, June 26th, for our next Black Voices Community Conversation. Families are still grappling with mass Chicago school, public school closures a decade later. I'll be talking with community leaders about educational outcomes since then and what's ahead under a new mayoral administration. To RSVP, you can visit WTTW.com slash events. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a proud sponsor of diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused free continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the region.